live from Santa Clara in the heart of Silicon Valley. It's The Cube, covering Cloud Foundry Summit 2017. Brought to you by the Cloud Foundry Foundation and Pivotal. Welcome back, I'm Stu Miniman, joined by my host, John Troyer. Uh, really excited to welcome to the program one of the keynote speakers uh, from this morning, Mojan Lefebvre, who is the SVP and Chief Information Officer, we always love CIOs, uh, from Liberty Mutual Insurance Global Specialty. Uh, thank you for your, uh, your keynote this morning and thank you so much for joining us on theCUBE. Thank you, thanks for having me. So, you went through a lot of data uh, and a lot of information in your keynote. Uh, Liberty Mutual, you say, spends a billion dollars uh, in tech yearly. Uh, so, I mean, that's, there's certain technology companies that spend that much. Um, as the CIO, uh, you know, what are some of the, the, the biggest things on your plate? And, uh, you know, we'll get into the discussion of Cloud Foundry and cloud and everything as we go from there. Sure, so I'd, I'd say probably the priorities differ by the business unit you're in. The specialty business has generally been a bit more manual and we have over 200 or so insurance products. So really automating it is very different from automating uh, consumer insurance, which is really focused on home and auto. So really, right now, our focus is increasing the productivity and the risk assessment for a lot of our underwriters. And then I'd say probably analytics, pricing, making sure that we're assessing risks uh, correctly is definitely another uh, point of focus for us. Okay, with so many products, uh, we, we understand the, the rate of change must be difficult. Uh, in your keynote, you spoke, spoke about embracing cloud and agile methodology. Maybe right. take us back to what some of the pain points were and uh, you know, led to yourself and management to embrace this big change. Yeah, absolutely. So several things are going on. One is that we see a lot of new players entering the world of insurance and it's both about new capital coming into the world of insurance just because there's not enough investments that capital can be put towards, so insurance is one place to come to, and the other is technology players that are coming into our world. You know, companies like Metro Mile, Lemonade, the list goes on and on, and so really our world is changing, technology is driving a lot of that change, and so we know that we've got to be a big player in that area as well, and, and as I said, really, we've got to become one of those software companies um, that, that can actually sell insurance as opposed to the other way around. Um, I'd say uh, some of the other things that, that are happening is the fact that our uh, employees, our consumers, now have all these other software companies that they have experience with, and so their expectations are very different. You know, they've got one experience when they're at home, and then they come into the workplace and it looks like you know, they've gone back 100 years. So that paradigm needs to change. And so those are some of the things that have really made us think we have no choice but to truly change the way that we deliver software. We've got to get out of this mode where everything takes multiple years and multiple millions of dollars, and really at the end of the day, the people that you, were, you started the work with are no longer even there to appreciate what you've delivered to them, and usually it's not what they asked for anyway. Uh, as you uh, adopted the Cloud Foundry platform, one of the things about Cloud Foundry, even very early in its, in its uh, life, life uh, cycle, mm -hmm. it was that it was associated with digital transformation and, and cloud native, right. um, and especially then once it was joined up with, up with Pivotal Labs. So how much of, of as you all embarked on this journey, uh, I mean, this, this is the, the great thing about here at Summit, right, there is a lot of talk about digital transformation, right. a lot of talk about Agile, and that's what we, we were just talking about. Yeah. Some shows you go to, right, uh, yeah. it's a lot about features, and a lot about speeds and feeds, and a lot about right. the latest, biggest. So how much a part of it, as you all were adopting uh, this platform, was that digital, that, that culture of digital transformation surrounding the actual tech, uh, how important was that? So I think that was very important because again, as I said, we know that that's what the consumers expect. They no longer want things to be manual. They want things to be at the tip of, of, of their fingers. And so really transforming us from being a company that's very paper intensive to really being more and more digital was, was critical to us. The very first application that we actually um, put in the cloud, which was in my business unit, was for document management in Alfresco. <laughs> and actually what we named it was We're Going Paperless. And so it's something that we started about three years ago and today I can say that, yep, we are paperless. And so the great thing about Alfresco was that it was indeed cloud native. And that was very important to us. 
we started out looking at some of the other solutions that are out there. I you know, won't necessarily name them, but, but they did not lend themselves to the cloud. And, and so really going with a cloud native uh, solution that would enable us to become much more digital and paperless was very critical to you, us. You talked a lot about developer adoption uh, now, that, uh, in your journey, where you yeah. are now in your journey. Was that a tough sell at the very beginning? Or did developers go, wait a minute, this is going to save me a lot of time, I'm, I'm on board. So you mean with Cloud Foundry with in Cloud general? With Cloud Foundry in general, yeah. So if anything, I'd say it was probably the developer community that really started this out. And so by the time that you know, the leadership and management kind of started to pay attention, there were pockets of developers who were just you know, very, very bought into it. And so I would say that went a long way. Um, and then made it easier to sell it to other developers because I say they're much more listening to what their peers are saying than what we have to say. And then really meeting with the Pivotal Labs guys, I mean, I'd say those folks have truly a magical way of, of selling their story and um, they've truly helped us not only sell it to our uh, developers but also sell the story to our business. I'd say the mindset shift from thinking I'm going to have everything in one go versus no, I'm going to get it in iterations and I'm actually going to trust the fact that you know, the next releases are going to come is a big mind shift and, and Pivotal was instrumental in helping sell, sell that to us. One of the benefits of Cloud Foundry is to give you flexibility as to where your, your applications and data live. Yeah. Um, that being said, it, it's a majority of customers that have deployed Cloud Foundry are doing it on premises. Um, how do you uh, kind of manage what co stays in your own environment, what handles in the public cloud, my understanding, you're, you're doing a, quite a bit of AWS uh, yeah. today. Yeah. Uh, what, what's your viewpoint for you and management on public cloud? Yeah, so we certainly see public cloud as the future. Um, I know Chip mentioned something about, well, it's not going to be cheaper. <laughs> We're actually counting on that in the end, you know, from a total cost of ownership perspective, that it will be cheaper, and we truly mean it when we say we want 75% of the people writing code, and by that I mean the staff within the IT group, of course, um, and, and we don't want them to have to worry about the infrastructure. And, and so while we've started with AWS, we absolutely have a relationship with Microsoft as well. We definitely want to be independent on, of this cloud, and I would say something like Cloud Foundry definitely allows you to do that. Yeah, and so when you're looking at that total, that, that full TCO, you don't have the fully burdened, I have gear and I have people managing that gear and all, all the operations there. If, if you can shift that piece of it, you're not differentiated on the infrastructure or have those needs. You yeah. want to focus on those you know, thousands of products that you have and your people coding to create those next applications. Exactly, right? we, want, we want to focus on the value add. That's, that's where we want our people to really be, be focusing and we want to let the cloud players who do it extremely well to be doing that for us. Yeah. You put forth in your keynote uh, some pretty audacious metrics. Uh, yep. I, I think it was you know 60% of the workload in public cloud, uh, more than 50% of apps uh, to, uh, to release code on a daily basis and you wanted 75% of the IT staff to write code. Yeah. Um, How'd you come up with those numbers? How are you doing against those? So yeah, so about a year ago, you know, once we decided that the imperative for change was so critical, the IT leadership team got together and we, we spent a couple of days off-site and we said, let's come up with what we ca we're calling today our IT manifesto. And so we said, we just have to change and there are multiple things that we're going to change. And we said, we're going to put some, what we called bold, audacious uh, moves or BAMs as, as they've come to be known together. And so those were just some, you know, we knew they were you know, out of reach to some extent but we said, if we don't really put some goals that are really hard to reach, we're never going to get there. And what are some of the headwinds there? What you know, have slowed you from meeting, meeting those? And any, any lessons learned that you, that you shared to your peers uh, on, on what you've learned going through this? So, so certainly deciding what goes to the cloud first um, is, is one of those areas that you know, we're, we're learning as, as we're doing. Um, we know that it's easy when you're working in a green field and it's something new, so yeah, you can very easily say, I'll build it in the cloud. When you're looking at what your existing um, environment is and what you move to the cloud, one of the questions is, well, if we move all of our dev environments, how's that going to interact with the production environments if you have them in different clouds? Other things are how it interacts with Active Directory and LDAP and some of those things. And I'd say finally it would be kind of the global applications always make it much more difficult as you think. You know, how do you replicate among different clouds in different geographies? Those are some of the 
kind of the, the blockers that we've got to tackle and, and make sure that we get around. Uh, one of the uh, interesting uh, parts of any kind of enablement strategy in, in, at any company, right, is skill, upskilling. Yeah. Uh, and so how have you been approaching that uh, in terms of the, you know, this new cloud native uh, world, right. uh, both for the devs, I mean, do you have a whole, are, are, is this here at Cloud Foundry Summit, do you, are people here tra learning, I mean, there's new certifications? Yeah, uh, so, so I'd say it's a, it's a multi-throng approach. We definitely have uh, partnered with, with several companies to put some training together to make sure that we're training our staff. Uh, we've started a program that we call Go For Code, and so we've asked for volunteers, for people who are not coding today and who want to get there, that actually they go to these coding schools and they're going to spend the next um, two to three months actually learning how to go. It's very so rigorous. They're in, so they might have been technical in, a, in an infrastructure way before and they want to yeah. learn how to code? Yeah, it may, it may be that or they may have just been business analysts oh, okay. who were just doing requirements gathering or project management and they want to learn how to code. So we've, be, we've tried to be as transparent as possible because you know, when you say I want 75% of my IT staff to be coding, and if you've got 50% who are not coding today, there's a message in that. And so, we, of course, it's up to us to make sure that we're providing the tools and what's needed for that to happen. Our goal is to get anyone on our staff who really wants to get there and is willing to put the sweat in to be able to do it. Because we also know it's not like, you know, software engineers are just lying out there on the street and, and then there's a shortage of software engineers and that's going to become more and more of a problem. So really getting our own employees that we value greatly um, to, to be able to do that transformation I think is critical for us. Uh, another great line you had in your keynote was out with the annual, in with the weekly. I, I think you said it was 16 releases in five months. Um, the counter to that, and I'm curious how you deal yeah. with it and talk to your peers is, how do people keep up with just all the changes that are happening? I mean, I, I talk to the, the companies that create code uh, on this regular cadence and, and they can't keep up with it. And how do you make sure your staff doesn't get burned out? Yeah, I'm so great, great question. Again, you know, we're, we're at the very beginnings of um, our transformation. The one thing I will say is looking at the team that did this and did the 16 releases in five months versus teams that are working on annual releases, the energy, the uh, enthusiasm, the excitement, and hopefully some of it came through in the video that you saw, is just phenomenal. So I'd say, you know, I'm much less worried about them burning out than, hey, can we keep the others as excited? Um, I would say automation and things like Cloud Foundry that actually help you automate your pipeline are critical. You cannot do you know, multiple releases or daily releases if you don't have those tools. If you truly get to the point where you do have the automated pipeline, I think a lot of that is done for you. So, so that's what we're gearing towards and driving towards. One of the things that people always love to pontificate is, in the future, what is the role of the CIO? Um, I'd love to see you embracing things like cloud because it was like, well, when I had gear and I had capital budget, I understood it, but you know, I'm changing the role, I'm doing that. What, what, do you, what, do you, what have you been seeing as the, the change in your role and, and anything down the line you see and how that changes? Yeah, I mean, so you're right. So a lot of people say, well, there is no need for a CIO in the future. I'd say there's probably more and more need for very business oriented strategic CIOs who also understand technology really well and and they're the epitome of you know, s someone who understands technology and is the head of engineering, so to speak, but also making sure that they can work very well with the business and understands the impact of technology on the business. I mean, you know, I'll be waiting for the day where that, the need for someone like that goes away. Um, I don't see it coming too soon. All right, the final question I have for you is, what brings you to an event like this? You know, spend the time, give the keynote. Uh, what, what, what do you get out of it, uh, you know, personally and for your company? So, so one one is really learning because again, if if you want to, it's kind of like if you're a doctor in medicine, if you want to keep up with what's going on around you, you've got to educate yourself. So certainly that aspect of go out there, see what's going on, uh, making sure that you're you're keeping up with um, with new technology. That's that's one thing. The other was. Um, my experience with Pivotal has been phenomenal and so I thought it was critical to actually take the opportunity to share that. Hopefully others will learn. Uh, one of the tweets that I saw was, well, if a big hundred year old insurance company can do this, then nobody has an excuse. And I'll say, yeah, of course, yeah. I, so, so it's really both to give back, 
and to continue to learn and then to reconnect with colleagues. Cornelia and I um, actually worked together over 10 years ago, so just coming here and being able to have dinner with her tonight is going to be very enjoyable. <laughs> Absolutely a tight-knit community. Really appreciate you coming on the program. We welcome you to the CUBE alumni uh, list now, uh, our community of, of the thousands that we've had on the program. So uh, for John and myself, uh, we'll be back with lots more coverage here from the Cloud Foundry Summit. Thanks for watching the CUBE.